Well, what is up, Schlockenauts? I am Darby Ellis Lewis Wilson, and we are going to review Barbarian and answer the 10 most asked questions on IMDb coming up next. Maybe the craziest movie that I've seen definitely in a long time, Barbarian. This movie... I kind of blacklisted it because of the way it was advertised. In hindsight, they had pretty good advertising. They made it look like a Justin Long romantic comedy, and then the trailer gets all crazy afterward. When I saw the trailer, I didn't realize what it would be. Like, I didn't understand what type of movie it was supposed to be. And I, and that was by design. Eventually, I decided to give it a, a try after seeing that it was getting rave reviews. So I'm like, okay, I got to see what this Barbarian movie is all about. And it looks like everybody either loves it or they absolutely hate it. I am in the love it camp. And after every movie I see, I, I usually go to IMDb. And through the reviews, I saw that people hated it because... They had so many questions. For me, that's the thing that I loved about it is that it does raise a lot of questions, but it has such robust world building in it that it lets you answer those questions on your own. It gives you two plus two a lot of the time, but it doesn't always give you four. It doesn't always give you the answer, but it gives you enough to extrapolate the answer. So before we go any further, I got to tell you, this is a spoiler heavy review Uh, It is definitely for people that have seen the movie already and want to dig in a little bit deeper into what Barbarian is about. So question number 10, what was the big twist? As I said, the way this movie was advertised and the way people talk about it is that there's this huge twist in the movie and people watched it. And I guess they didn't know what it was supposed to be. A a lot of the negative reviews I saw, people are saying, oh, it was so predictable. What was the twist? Let me tell you what. This movie was not predictable. If you watch the beginning of this movie and there's this woman standing in the rain trying to get into this Airbnb that's been double booked by by Pennywise, by Bill Skarsgård, and you immediately thought, oh, underground uh, incest mutant. That's where this movie is going. You should buy a lottery ticket. You are the smartest person on the earth. But if you thought that it was predictable because she went downstairs, because she went into the the dark basement, that is the language of cinema. That is how horror movies work, right? These people have to make these decisions to go do these things that normally you would think is are, are stupid, but it also has to be believable. And I think that they did a good job of making it believable once the world was settled. What the movie tries to make you believe is that Keith is potentially dangerous. Is he some sort of creep that like broke into the house? Like what's his game? And so we know from the, from the preview that there's like, you know, some sort of weird underground area, but is it, his weird underground area. And the way this movie is structured is very interesting. It's basically like a two act movie. It's a three act movie, but it's two short films, more or less completely separate from one another. And then in the third act, it brings them together for the finale. So director Zach Kreger, the way this movie developed was he read a book called The Gift of Fear. And it was about uh, women trusting their gut instincts about uh, men being dangerous. And so he decided to write a short film about a woman that meets a man and all of these red flags are going off. And that's essentially what the first half of the movie is. Tess and Keith having this interaction where you think that Keith might be a creep. And I swear every woman watching this movie is like, girl, don't go in there. What are you doing? Staying, go find another hotel. The second movie, uh, we get Justin Long's character introduced completely separate. This movie is about women's interaction with men and how men sort of push their will upon women. And we see that in essentially three different parts. So first, we get the Keith character, who 
In hindsight, uh, he has no malicious intent as far as we know, but he is throwing up red flags for her. Then we see Justin Long's character, AJ. He may have raped somebody. It's it's kind of kept up in the air. And he even tells a friend of his that, that no, I'm just I was just really persistent. He kept pushing his will onto onto her to where uh, it gets into like kind of a gray area. And then we get our third main male, who is Frank. And we get a flashback of Frank in the 80s. He is definitely absolutely a rapist. Like there is no, there is no doubt about it. So we're seeing sort of three different interactions of, of men pushing their will onto women. One is innocent, one is in the gray area, and one is definitely past the line into the absolutely evil area. Next question, number nine. Who built the tunnels? Frank, duh, absolutely. We see Frank, he's in this nice neighborhood. He goes and he creeps on this woman. He goes and unlocks her window so that he can go in later, kidnap her and take her to his weird sex dungeon that he has built under the ground of this neighborhood that uh, we see is starting to become... Uh, in decline and eventually we get into the modern day where it is completely run down question number eight what is the mother a lot of people were trying to figure out what the mother was how she came to be um because we get the character andre the the homeless man who says that she is the product of generations of inbreeding that this man frank would steal women impregnate them and they'd have babies and then he'd impregnate their babies. And it's just generations and generations of incest. However, the implication is that the mother is 40 years old. If she was born in 1980 and this woman that he interacted with was the woman that he kidnapped and then she gave birth, how could that be generations of incest? Here's the deal. That was just a snapshot of Frank's depravity he could be inbred himself we'll throw that out there he could have been doing this for like 20 years prior to 1980 if he was 40 in 1980 he could have started this this evil act in his 20s he absolutely could have potentially gotten a few generations of monster mutant babies so what the mother is we're seeing in this movie sort of how men and women interact we have to ask ourselves what comes of this interaction and the movie in a way tells us the mother this creature this monster comes from this negative interaction i would say the mother is feminism she is a distortion of the masculine right she's full of rage she's absolutely pushy like the men are and she's also a distortion of femininity she wants to be a nurturer she wants to take care of people like they're her baby she's naked she's supposed to be vulnerable we see like this distortion of of both genders put together into one creating this this weird violent creature number seven why weren't tess and keith killed the first night the mother creature she is mothering what she tries to do when she sees these people is her first instinct is to try and take care of them provided they don't piss her off she tries to take care of them so uh this question is kind of an amalgamation of other questions because some people were, were under the impression that the house may have been haunted uh because of the door that opens and closes the door that opens and closes it's it's just uh a poorly built door right i uh, I've had one in my own home before where it just, it will swing close. Uh, I think it locks because it gets jammed. And so I think the mother, I think she knows how to open up that lock. And when anybody comes and stays in the Airbnb, she comes in and she checks on them. So Tess, she wakes up in the middle of the night. As we can see, she hears a noise and she looks up and the door to her room is open. She thinks it's Keith who's sleeping on the couch having night terrors. But as she's moving, we see a figure behind her move back into the basement. Now, what's going on is that the mother came up to check on them, 
right? As, as a parent goes into a sleeping child's room to make sure they're okay. This is what caused uh, Keith's nightmares. But then she also goes into Tess's room to check on her and unfortunately wakes her up. Number six, how did Tess stay alive for two weeks? So midpoint of the movie, we see that she gets captured by the mother. Uh, then once Justin Long's character, AJ, uh, gets captured in the tunnels. We see that Tess is there and she's alive. And I believe they say earlier in the movie, pr prior to that point, that it's been two weeks since the last people stayed at the Airbnb. So while she's in the tunnel, how does she stay alive? Well, we see it immediately when the mother comes in and she sticks the nasty, nasty bottle down into the crate and Tess drinks from it. There potentially could have been other things to eat down there. Frank is down there, um, maybe with some canned goods, and maybe the mother took some of that. Cannibalism? I don't know. We could potentially expand it to that. It would make sense. But we know that at least two other people have survived down there for a period of time. And we know that one of them likes to give people baby bottles of what is supposedly breast milk. Yeah, that's right. She is some sort of prime evil wet nurse. Question number five, why didn't Andre leave? So Andre, the homeless man, he is living in this neighborhood where he is very aware that there is this creature that comes out at night and will stalk people and come and kill them. Why the hell didn't he get out of there? A very interesting thing about this movie is that Jordan Peele, I believe, consulted quite a bit on the movie. And I think that uh, in this question, and the next question, uh, you can see his influence in this movie quite a bit because he's kind of built himself up as a master of social commentary. And from what I understand, the display of Detroit, what I've read from, from comments is that it's fairly accurate, uh, that this is kind of a social economical issue. And so what I think Andre is representing, people that do not have the resources to leave bad neighborhoods, to leave bad situations. He's lived there for quite a while. I think he's one of those people, when you see like a, a forest fire is coming towards your home, he's like, I've lived here my entire life. I'm not going to leave. This is my home. And I think Andre feels the same way. And as far as he knows, and, and he says this right before he gets his arm ripped off and he's beaten to death with it, that she's never come into that area by the water tower and bothered him. So he had every reason to believe that they were safe where they were at. Question number four, why didn't the cops help? Easy. They thought that she was a crackhead and it's in a bad neighborhood. Why would they spend their time uh, wasting their resources. I think this is part of the social commentary. And I, I think it comes from kind of a universal uh, frustration from the police that is is really big in public discourse nowadays. Also, right, if the police came and took care of it, we wouldn't have a movie. That's kind of on the meta level. But the idea is that they're in this terrible, terrible neighborhood where the only people that live there are people that essentially kind of want to live outside of the law. So they're not going to waste their time uh, trying to police that area. So they leave. Number three, how did the house get double booked? Now, I think this is a really good question. And I think that, that this leads into kind of uh, a series of logistical questions that, that people can ask about this movie that I think are, are, are worth taking note of. Uh, but in the movie, they do give an explanation of why the house was double booked and it's simply because keith got the house from one website and tess got the house from another website it's it's purely a case of mismanaged bureaucracy things like that happen they happen in real life and they have to happen in horror movies why did uh so and so's car break down next to the inbred hillbillies uh in the hills have eyes things like this happen in real life and in horror movies, they just so happen to happen next to uh, people who are some type of serial killer. Other more reasonable logistical questions are, uh, I think, how is it that there's such a nice, pristine house with a very nice, well-kept yard in this area and it hasn't been tainted? One, there's this big inbred mutant monster running around that keeps people away. 
Uh, two, the house was maybe remodeled after the the downfall of of the neighborhood. So most of the people have just moved away from there. Also, Tess's vehicle. If Tess and Keith weren't the first people to to be killed at this Airbnb, you know, why aren't there more vehicles around there? It depends on how you want to logistically work through this neighborhood, but it's a bad neighborhood. They're nice cars. Perhaps the cars in the past were stolen. Perhaps Tess's car at some point in time could have been stolen or moved off or maybe even towed. So number two, the second biggest question that people ask, people just could not believe this. They could not suspend their disbelief for this question. How could all of Detroit be booked. So when Tess, she she finds out that her Airbnb is double booked, she is trying to call another hotel. She calls one, the rooms are all booked up and Keith comes and tells her, oh, hey, there's a convention in town. All of the hotels are booked. Again, cinematic language. We don't need to watch her making uh, 20, 30 calls, right? We just need to see her make one and see that it doesn't work. In a more practical sense, yeah, maybe not every hotel room in all of Detroit was booked, but when there are big conventions in town, it sometimes becomes really hard to to book a room or at the very least, the rooms that are free skyrocket in price. Now, what's going on is they're not in Detroit proper, right? They're in like a suburb of Detroit. They're in uh, Brightmore, I think is where they are. It could potentially take up to an hour to get into Detroit or get to someplace different. So there might not be any hotels between here and there. Um, but I think more practically what's happening is that it's probably midnight, one in the morning, and she's trying to find a hotel and she could find one, but it's going to be three in the morning by the time she finds one. It would just be more practical to stay. And he's flirting with her. And we see that as a bit of a threat prior until she finds out that he's kind of the guy that she wants to see because uh, that's the job she's going to interview for is to uh, be a part of a documentary that's going to interview him potentially. And so then her whole demeanor flips around to where now they can be be flirty. I think it makes sense for the movie, right? It's. It, I don't think it's something that's literally true. I think it's figuratively true and it works for the situation. Here it is. Their number one most asked question about Barbarian. Why is the movie called Barbarian? Barbarian is a provocative name. Like, what does that mean? It, it, it's supposed to entice you into watching the movie. Zach Kreger, the director, he used it as a placeholder. When he wrote his first short film, he had it take place on Barbary Street. The word barbarian itself is sort of a cultural, racial slur in a way. Let me get on to Merriam-Webster and I'll read to you the definition of barbarian. Barbarian. A person from an alien land, culture, or group believed to be inferior, uncivilized, or violent. Where the word barbarian came from, it came from, I believe, Greek culture, ancient Greek culture, because the ancient Greeks, they believed that they were the bee's knees of the world. They believed that they were the height of society. They thought that they had the best language. And so they called other people outside of their culture barbarians because they thought that when people outside of their culture spoke, it just sounded like bar, 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 like dumb. <laughs> so that's that's why uh, it came to have this certain connotation. Now, if we look at this definition, uh, uncivilized, violent, right? That is sort of what the mother is, right? We, we know that she that she surely hasn't gone, gone to school. She, she's probably not very intelligent. She's absolutely violent. She doesn't fit into social conventions in any way. So she's not, she's not civilized. However, I think the implication is more of Frank. Frank is the true barbarian, right? He, he acts in savage ways, uh, stealing and raping and torturing women without a doubt. And in fact, the mother, uh, she has probably, I mean, she was raised by him. She, she was probably tortured and sexually mistreated by him throughout her entire life, which by the way, barbary is a derivative of the word barbarian. 
And I did not know this, but Barbara is a derivative of the word barbarian. So I'm going to go out on a limb and say, maybe the mother's name is Barbara. This movie takes place on Barbary Street. And I love this. So uh, again, when I saw the preview for this, I was like, why is it called Barbarian? As soon as I found out it took place on Barbary Street, I was like, oh, Barbarian. Okay, that makes sense. I can buy that. And I don't know if Zach Kreger in, intended to do this, but for me, it brings up the idea of the Barbary slave trade, a North African slave trade where Black people and white people and just anybody they got captured and were put into slavery. Uh, I, I think it was like the biggest slave trade in the world. And so what we see going on here when we find old Frank, we see his videos and they have like all of these descriptions of, of these women. But here's the thing. We're kind of led to believe that, that he's done all of this. What if those aren't all of his videos? What if he is part of, of some sort of weird uh, underground slave trade where they are uh, passing VHSs back and forth to each other. And so it's really kind of some, some terrible human trafficking thing going on, like the Barbary slave trade. I don't know if there's any connection there, but I, I think it's actually a better name for the movie than people actually realize. I think this movie is ripe for a sequel or a series. We could go back in time and see Frank capturing women and someone trying to thwart him. We could go into a direct sequel because Andre says the mother isn't the worst thing down there. Now, I think he's talking about Frank, but there could be some sort of giant incest mutant baby down there as well. We could go into maybe every town has a Barbary Street, right? When it, Wherever there are these rundown neighborhoods, what if there are these evil men that move in and do this awful thing. And so we can move this movie to another location. There's just a lot of places that we can go with this film. Now, I, I don't know if we'll get it because the movie, it's it's slightly art house, but it's slightly uh, into the uh, mainstream hokey horror movies that we see. And, and that's one of the reasons I love it because it just switches in tone back and forth so much. It only costs about $4 million to make. And I think it made about $44 million in the world of Hollywood horror that screams sequel. But as far as I can tell, these are the most asked questions about the movie Barbarian. I hope this clears some things up for you. Uh, I hope you realize that there is a whole language of, of cinema out there. And if you want to learn more about that, I invite you to come watch our playlist over here where we review a ton of horror movies free on Tubi uh, and check out over here our latest uh, review of Who Knows What. Anyway, I'm Darby Ellis Lewis Wilson, and I have been compelled by Schlock. See you later, guys. I am